I'm Jen Mallon. Welcome to Come Home. We're going to have a wonderful day. Hope is going to be restored. Captives are going to be set free. Deliverance is going to come. Addictions are going to be broken. You are going to be just encouraged because what if there is an area in your life where you feel discouragement as it pertains to yourself, a habit you haven't been able to overcome, a family member that you've been praying for and you're just seeing them get worse instead of better, you're going to be so happy because guess what? God is no respecter of persons. Pastor Michelle Steele is here and she's going to share her story. This story literally reads like uh, a fiction novel, except it's not. It's her life pre-Jesus. It's a life of being a runaway, being a prostitute, uh, being pimped out, cocaine addiction, ODing twice, all kinds of things that could have and should have taken her life. But God, he had a plan. And I love Luke 1, 37, where it says, with God, nothing is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And he knew that when she got born again, she was going to write, she was going to speak, she was going to pastor, she was going to love, and she was going to go after Satan and his kingdom and expose it and then help others in their journey. So I'm so delighted that she's here with us today. We're gonna get so much out of our time with her. Now, before we go, to the living room, we've got a short thing that we would like for you to take a look at. Call your friends, text them, send them this link, tell them to go on ctnonline.com to watch this program. It's going to be powerful. God loves you. And I pray that you'll be able to locate something powerful in this story for you and what you're walking through and what you're praying for. Hi, I'm Jennifer Walker, and today we're gonna to talk about making a safe sleep environment. Well, that's perfect timing, because it's time to put him down for a nap. Oh, great. So we're gonna put him down. No, not in this crib. Well, but those stuffed animals are so cute. You know what else is cute? A sleeping baby. These are not safe. Well, surely we can keep this nice, soft blanket. No loose blankets, Laura. It's not safe. Well, can I at least keep the mobile? Because look how cute these are. Babies learn by association and routine, and we want them to associate crib time with sleep time. So we want to make this sleep environment as boring as possible. There's nothing to do in here but sleep. No pillows, loose blankets, pillow-like crib bumpers, or stuffed animals. This, this is the ideal sleep environment. It's 68 to 72 degrees, the baby's in a onesie with a swaddle under three months of age, and the white noise is on high. And it's good to note that during the day, we can actually have a little natural sunlight coming in, and at night, we want it pitch black dark, just like the womb. We're just kind of recreating that great womb environment. But I really love this projector that shoots stars up on the ceiling. Was your womb a disco? <laughs> no. We're gonna turn this white noise on and we are going to have an ideal, safe sleep environment that was created just for this little one to make those associations and help him to know the difference between daytime sleep, nighttime sleep, and get those long stretches. Right, sweet one, it's time to go sleepy house. Good night. Aren't Jen and Laura adorable? They have so many tips and helpful hints that they have learned by experience 
And I really wish that I had had their material when I was a new mom and that I, when I had a newborn and a toddler. And so we so appreciate them helping us in the things that we deal with in our home life. Well, today I have a special guest. I feel like I can say that she is my friend because I met her many years ago when she and her husband first began pastoring and they had such a heart for their city and for souls and for the broken and the unchurched. And they had such a passion to go into the highways and byways. And we used to have an international training center. They didn't come once or twice or three times or four times, but they came over and over and then they brought their volunteers and they brought their staff and they just immersed themselves in the heart of God and going out. Now, since then, they are pastors um, over not one church, but two. They have three children and they are authors and they share truth. Another thing I love about Pastor Michelle and her husband, Philip Steele, is that they are real and they are raw and they tell their stuff. They're very transparent, but the whole purpose is to help others. And so without further ado, I introduce you to the wonderful, anointed, beautiful Pastor Michelle Steele. <laughs> Praise Thank God. You. Thank you so much for having me on. What a beautiful opportunity, not only to get to catch up with you and to visit with you, but to also share what God has done with your viewers. Thank you. Well, thank you for continuing to just run the race and to multiply and duplicate and just be so in love with Jesus. And you have a new daughter since the last time I yes, saw you. Yes. How exciting. <laughs> Well, the Lord is good to lead us, to guide us, yeah. and not only to establish in our lives, but to use us for His glory. So and praise God. Yay. Well, over the years, I just have seen uh, the books you've written and the programs you've been on, and I've been so like, yay, go, go. <laughs> and so when I saw your last book, um, Escaping Hell, your story that God has finally had you pen kind of in its entirety. I was like, oh, Lord, please let her come. Yes. Okay, let's tell the viewers, those that are watching and, and don't know just where you came from, just the danger, the destructive lifestyle that you had from teenager runaway to your mid-20s. Kind of fill them in and then we'll share your Jesus journey. Yes. Well, this year, August of 2022, marked... 30 years wow. that I've been walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> free from the life of addiction and crime and destruction that I had before. But as you mentioned, I, I started out in a place that I almost lost my life a few times, a yeah. few times. Um, even before I ran away, there were things that were setups for destruction in my life things that just kind of put in me a brokenness that I wanted to destroy things that were good. You know, I said um, many times that if you look at somebody and just say, well, it's, their, it's where they're at that causes them to make those decisions. I learned to drive in a Mercedes Benz. I grew up with my own Tennessee walking horse. I babysat for country music stars. I went trick-or-treating at, at country music stars houses. It, you would have looked at my life and thought, she's got it all together. Mm. My parents were gonna pay for college. Everything was just laid out before me. But on the inside, that destruction, you know, I had had two different, uh, ex situations, three different men who molested me when I was a, a teenager, and, and that was a part of it. I was already in a vulnerable place of, you know, after my parents divorced and not having that stability, but when I was molested, I began to, um, I, I began to blame myself and that destruction. I can look back and see how I would make decisions that were bent towards destruction. And that's why the subtitle, <laughs> God's Power to Restore a Life That's Bent on Destruction. Yeah. And I ran away from home. And when I ran away, I ended up uh, involved with a young man who became my pimp and later my husband. 
and we began a crime spree that from the time that I was 15 years old to the time that I was 23, we were in and out of trouble with the law. Uh, we were in Nashville, Tennessee, and we were homeless at times. We had, uh, you know, run-ins with the law. At one point when we were being arrested, one of the police officers says, you two are a regular Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, boy. <laughs> That is not the kind of compliment we it, it want, was, right? It was not something that you want to have as, as you know, something that people recognize yeah. about your life. But, yeah. you know, I was, um, I became a drug addict to cover up the shame in my life. Some people turn to the prostitution to pay for their addiction, but I turned to the addiction to cover up the shame of the prostitution. And you know, when I, I remember that first time that I was, you know, coerced into going out and selling my body, I, I remember thinking this, I hate every minute of this, but I'm doing it because, you know, I want his attention. I want him to, to love me. And I, I sold my body pregnant. I was pregnant with my first child and I was up until like three weeks before she was born, I was climbing in and out of, of trucks, selling my body at a truck stop and hating myself for it. And so the addiction became my way of escape. And it was, it was never, I, I was never a social partying and then got caught up. It was an escape from my reality. Yeah. And I remember making the declaration, I will never be sober another day in my life. And if I had to go steal a bottle of NyQuil and drink the whole bottle just to be able to escape the sobriety, I did that because I couldn't stand to look at myself in the mirror. I couldn't stand who I was. I, I covered it up. I made everybody think I was enjoying this lifestyle and I was, I was in you know control of what I was doing, but you know, Pastor Jen, I didn't buy my children a Christmas present during that whole time. If yeah. I had any money, it went into my arm. Yeah. I remember somebody bringing me a Christmas card with money in it. And instead of me going down on Christmas Eve when they're about to open presents for my children and buying presents from the dollar store or whatever could have been open, instead I got that money and went to the projects and got high before the family celebration. Mm. And I, I can look back at those times now and see, but when I was there in it, I didn't realize how hopeless I was. You know, when my first husband died of a drug overdose, we had been given, um, he had been charged with three counts of armed robbery. I was in the car. I was charged with the attempted armed robbery. Because you were an accomplice. Because I was an accomplice. Yeah. We went into court that day and he made a plea agreement for them to release me and he would plead guilty. And so they accepted that agreement and they gave him a few days to get his affairs in order. He was out on bond and told him when he needed to turn himself into the prison. And someone had met him at the courtroom that day and said, hey, come here. I got something for you. Took him into the men's bathroom and put a patch. It was similar to a nicotine patch, but it was filled with morphine. Oh. It was enough morphine for a cancer patient for three days, oh. but something went wrong with that morphine patch and three days worth of morphine released into his body. And he went to sleep that night so high I'd never seen him. I'd gotten high with that man for years and years, and I'd never seen him that high. But he went to sleep that night and didn't wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And my life that was already out of control went completely haywire. Even more out of control. Right? I, I don't remember even telling my children about his death. There were, we were in the ICU of the hospital and people were bringing me drugs to the hospital. I was high while he was there in the intensive care unit. And when the family decided to pull the plug and release him, I, I, I don't even remember being present to tell my children. It was so, it was so out of control that 
I died a few weeks later of my second cocaine overdose. I went into a, a complete spiral and I was doing drugs day and night, night and day. And I had been like three days nonstop with no food, no water. And I was doing the cocaine shot after shot so that I couldn't even feel it anymore. And I was asking the person who was supplying the drugs, give me more. And so they would put more in and I took all of it, put it up into the syringe, put it in my arm. And before I could even release the belt that was tied around my arm, my heart stopped and I left my body. Hmm. I stood in front of a skull. It wasn't a skeleton, it was a skull that was as tall as I was. And in that moment, I realized that hell was real. Before that moment, it was just a joke yeah. to me. Something you mock and it, it doesn't, cause you feel like you're already in hell. Yes. Like the life you're living, so it didn't intimidate you. It did not intimidate me. I thought this is what I, for, for all of those years, I didn't think there was hope for God to save me that God was interested in me. I thought the way that I've lived, God hates me. Aww. You know, my first husband, before he had gone to court, he went to church with his grandmother and they invited me to go to church. And I said, I can't go in the church. The walls will fall, yes. the lightning will strike. You know, I, I made all of the excuses and, and, you know, made that tough exterior. No, I don't need God. But he went to church and accepted Jesus that day. So when he... Right before he died. Right, the day before he put that patch on. And he put that patch on not knowing it was... That was it. What, but he, I believe he is in heaven with the Lord today. Merciful God. Isn't he so gracious? The thief on the cross moment. And I those didn't. good old grandmother prayers. Yes. They're powerful. Yes. yes. And the prayers of our children. Yeah. I didn't realize that they were going to church and getting their Sunday school teacher to pray for us. Aww. But I thought God hated me. Mm. And so I wouldn't go to God because I thought he's just going to reject me. I hated me. Why wouldn't God hate me? Yeah. In that moment, though, when I realized how close I was to hell, I decided I don't want to go to hell. There were hands of darkness. They weren't black hands. It was as if darkness had hands and those Ooh. hands began to reach out and to try to grab a hold of me. And as they reached out to try to grasp me, I, I ran, I ran back to my body. And the person who was doing CPR said that one minute they're you know, struggling to try to get my heart to beat and the next minute they're fighting me off because I ran back to my body and I began to fight. And he let me up and I got up off the floor. I was in the, a bar in the projects of oh. East Nashville. And I ran through the rain with blood dripping down my arm for blocks, <laughs> trying to escape the hell that was reaching for me. Oh. I went to church that night to the same church where my children attended. Yeah. They weren't quite sure what to do with me. They kind of patted me Aww. on the back when I came up for prayer. But the people who had prayed with my first husband found out that I had come to church that night and they came and got me and took me to a revival. And they had prayed with me in the hospital. And, and in that time in the hospital, I'd opened my heart and said, God, if you can help me, I want help. But when they took me to that revival, the preacher came and he said, I slept through the first, I was so high on drugs. Yeah. I slept through the first service and they woke me up. They, <laughs> they brought me back the next night and, and he woke me up in my pew. Wow. And he said, do you want help? And I stood up and I said, I do, I want help. Aww. And the power of God met me that day, wow. August 10th, 1992. <laughs> when I got up from the floor, I wanted to say that man knocked me down, yeah. but it wasn't the man, no. it was the power of God. <laughs> Before I could accuse him, I realized I am more sober in this moment than I have been in over eight years. Wow. And they led me to the Lord and I accepted Jesus as my savior on that day. That is. And I've been walking with him clean and sober and giving God all the glory from that time until now. Thank God. Thank <laughs> Isn't God good? God, he's wonderful. He is so good.
Well, and you know that I wondered uh, how you named your book um, Escaping Hell. And that was it, was that that out-of-body experience when you had died and yes. they were doing CPR on you and you ran from hell and you ran back to the arms of God. Yes. Okay, so here you are, you've lost your husband, you've lost custody of your children, you're, you, you're steeped in shame, condemnation, guilt, uh, you don't know what to do, you know, bent on destruction, and now you meet the Lord. And so what was that process um, of how you started to grow and walk and mature and be discipled and get delivered and forgive yourself and forgive others, your molesters and those who had hurt you. Yes. In preparing the book, I came through all of the things that the Lord has taught me in these 30 years. Yeah. And I, I identified five fundamental things. And I, those five fundamental things have established my walk with Him. And so when the very first thing that I had to identify is that I am not who I used to be. So yeah. fundamental m number one is meet the new you. Yes, I love and that. And you have to get identification proof. You have to prove that you are the new you. You yeah. know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, the old is passed away, all things are created new. But I needed evidence. I needed the proof. Yes. And so God took me to evidence. And the first thing I have to get is my death certificate. Ooh, I like that. And my death certificate is in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me yes. so completely that I believe I was there with him yeah. in the mind of God. I am crucified with Christ. The old Michelle, the before Christ, the Michelle BC, yeah. she's passed away. Hallelujah. Got a tombstone, <laughs> right? She's yes. in the grave. The death certificate is there in Galatians 2. And I had to take that scripture and I had to feed on that scripture until I could see the old Michelle dead, yeah. crucified on the cross. And then Romans chapter 6 says that we are resurrected into the newness of life. It says that we're buried and resurrected. So I have proof of where the old Michelle is buried. Yeah. Romans chapter six, that's my burial plot. Love it. And then I have my birth certificate there in Romans chapter yes. six, that I'm resurrected into the newness of life and Ephesians two as well. But Ephesians two takes us a step further. We've got our death certificate. We've got our burial plot evidence. We've got our birth certificate. But when you get your driver's license, if you ever move, you've got to go get your address changed. Yeah. So Ephesians 2 gives us our address change because we are seated together with Christ in heavenly yes, places. Those had to be established in me for me to move forward in any way in Christ because if I tried to live the life I live today with the guilt of my past, with an identification of the prostitute, an identification of the junkie, an identification yeah. of the woman who had the abortion. All of those things would have, would have been the evidence that I couldn't do what I'm doing today. But I have evidence that that person is dead and a new person is walking in this body today. I love that. And I will say this, you know, to anyone watching, these five fundamentals are wonderful. They are gold. And I really encourage everyone to get Escaping Hell. You can get it on Amazon. You can go to uh, Pastor Michelle Steele's website, which is buildfaith.net. Buildfaith.net, it's, it's on the screen. But okay, so we only have a few minutes left. So let's fast forward to one of my favorite fundamentals because um, they're all good. And we won't give them all away because you have to get the book. But I love the third one that is apply the blood correctly. So I want you to speak on that for a minute. And then I want you to pray um, because those, there's those watching that are struggling with sin and, and guilt and condemnation. They don't know how to recover. And yet God has helped you recover and you have victoriously walked with him because of these fundamentals. Yes. So talk about applying the blood correctly. correctly. That was a game changer for me because I began my new life in Christ 
And the Lord began to restore my life. He brought Pastor Philip Steele into my life, who is <laughs> a good the guy. man who loves me like Christ loves the he church. Does. He is such a man of God. And we began to establish our life. God gave me custody of my children back. And we're rebuilding, we're, we're building a new life together and expecting a child. And I began to show evidence I was losing that child. And my husband wanted to stand and said, God will restore that. God will strengthen the baby in your womb. But I had a shame that I wasn't even aware of mm. that stood up and hindered me from operating in the righteousness of God in Christ that yeah. I am. And it took a couple of years for God to reveal to me how the enemy had stolen. But it was during a, a study I was doing on the blood of Jesus that I began to see the difference between guilt and shame. And I knew I was free of the guilt but I had not ever dealt with the shame. Mm. And shame is that feeling in the consciousness that, that begins to interrupt that operation of righteousness. Yeah. We are the righteousness yes, are. of God in Christ Jesus. But if we allow shame to operate, it will cause us to lay down that breastplate of righteousness yeah. and that shame will, will destroy what God's trying to do. So I found a scripture in Hebrews chapter nine in that study on the blood of Jesus. And it said that if the blood of bulls and goats could, could cover and purge the conscience of those under the Old Testament, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge our conscience? Amen. I needed my conscience yes. purged. Yes. And it was then that I learned I needed to plead the blood, interact with the blood, apply the blood more than just that time of when I accepted Jesus yes. as Lord. But I had to bring the blood of Jesus into my everyday walk. And I want to pray for you today. Maybe you're dealing with shame. Maybe you're experiencing that interruption in the, the righteousness that God has made you to be in Christ. I want to pray for you today. If first of all, Accept Jesus as Lord. Make this decision. Father, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for my sin, and I accept that. Now, I believe you raised him from the dead, and I make Jesus the Lord of my life. And today, I want to pray over you the power of God to come into the home where you are to minister life to you, to bring healing to your life and set you free from addiction from shame in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Michelle. I want to just talk and talk and talk, <laughs> but we, I want to, you've got to come back. I want you to bring Pastor Philip, and I encourage everybody to get this. God's pursuing you. Whatever destructive thing you've done, He's greater. This book will encourage you. I appreciate you being with us today. Go to buildfaith.net and grab it. Get our teaching materials. My name's Jen Mallon. Come home.